Hi, everyone. How are you? You're awesome? Okay, good. I'm going to try to keep it there. Um, I wrote up my speech, and I want to just say for a vulnerability moment that um, I normally don't write up speeches. Normally, I like take this microphone, I walk all over the place, and I'm all fantastic. Um, <laughs> But I had an emergency surgery a couple months ago, and since then I've just been like giving in to the fact that I'm totally kind of overwhelmed. And it's all good overwhelm, but it means that I can't take the risk of just walking around being all fabulous because who knows what would come out. And I wanted to be really intentional with y'all. So is that okay? All right. Um, so first of all, thank you for the work that you're doing to bend the future towards justice and liberation. Um, I'm really excited to be in this space with all of you. I've been to a Bali gathering before, and every time I'm just like, oh, these are all the futurists in action. And it's cool to see you. I hope you see yourselves as very cool Matrix-style futurists in action. Um, but if you don't, hopefully you will after this. I would call your work science fictional behavior, being concerned with the ways our actions and beliefs now, today, will shape the future and the tomorrows. Um, you're excited by what you can create. You believe it is possible to create new worlds. You've been building it here the last few days and in your lives. You're believers. So am I. As Michelle mentioned, I'm the co-editor of an anthology of original science fiction from social justice movements called Octavia's Brood. It's named after Octavia Butler. Um, honors her. Have any of you read her work? Yeah? Um, for the rest of you... Octavia Butler, just go read everything and then you'll be a better human. Um, our book just sold out of its first printing of 10,000 copies, and, which is like very yay. And for us, it's yay because we're like, I know about 2,000 people, you know like 2,000 people. So math-wise, that means it's gone beyond us, right? Um, which means it's very public that I believe in this new world building um, but I've held that belief system for a long time, and I think it's because I was born to a Trekkie, meaning one who watches Star Trek obsessively. Uh, my father watched Star Trek in a way that now seems logical to me. He watched the way a black man from the Deep South who was bringing up mixed-race children in a racist world would watch a post-racist narrative, um, eyes wide, faith bubbling up. We all watched it together as his military career took our family from place to place. My parents intentionally took us away from the U.S. for our early years. And I think they believed when we came back, things would be different. Um, and when they weren't, they brought us back anyway, and they took us to Georgia. Have any of you been to Georgia? Any of y'all from Georgia? Okay, hey. Um, I'm from South Carolina, but Georgia's harder. <laughs> Uh, so I think what I experienced in Georgia, the casual and constant presence of white supremacy, the knee-jerk assessments of my intelligence and humanity, is one of the foundational catalysts for my study of science fiction and apocalypse and emergence and complexity. I thought in middle school, and I also think now, that this can't be all. No one will survive in this approach long term. The purpose of our species cannot be to constantly identify each other as other, build walls between ourselves, and engage in both formal and informal wars against each other's bodies, and build economies that could never serve a whole. I feel miraculous. It's confusing to feel so miraculous when so many people hate my skin and my history, but I still feel it. And I see the miraculousness in others. Even those who hate me have heartbeats, and I generally assume have people that they love. So why can't they love me? Should I love them anyway? How can I hold these massive contradictions? I started reading science fiction obsessively looking for options, other worlds where I wasn't dismissed as an idealist or an inferior. On that path, I discovered Octavia Butler. Decades before my birth, she was working the same edges in her heart, pendulum swinging between curiosity, possibility, and hopelessness. If we can't articulate more viable futures and adapt, our future is hopeless. She understood that. She felt it. She wrote novels with young black women protagonists, meeting aliens, surviving ap apocalypse, evolving into vampires, becoming telepathic networks, time traveling to save their slave owner ancestors. And woven throughout her work, there were two things. One, a coherent and visionary exploration of humanity. 
and two, emergent strategies for better humans. Like, how do we be better? I'll talk about emergent strategy more in a second. First of all, I want to say that my, my co-editor for Octavius Brood and I, we don't call our work science fiction, even though that's what's on the cover of the book, because uh, everyone's like, you can't call it something else, because no one's heard that term yet, so no one would buy it. But I'm going to tell you what we really call it. We really call it visionary fiction. We write fiction that disrupts the hero narrative concept that one person um, is going to save us. Often that one person is a white man. Often it's Matt Damon, um, <laughs> who I love. I mean, he's a great guy. I like his water politics. Um, but I don't think he's going to save me, you know? Um, we write fiction. I, I keep telling, on the tour, I keep telling people, like, our stories are the kind of stories where Matt Damon couldn't be cast as the lead, you know? And then everyone's like, oh, okay, I get it, I get it. No, I totally understand that. Um, we write fiction that explores change as a collective process, um, that explores change from the bottom up, fiction that centers those who have been currently marginalized, um, and not to be nice, which I think sometimes people are like, we should write a story with like a black person in the lead, because that would be nice. Um, but we actually think that those who survive on the margins of the current economy tend to be the most experientially innovative. Um, they're practicing survival-based efficiency, doing the most with the least. And that's an important skill to have on a planet whose resources are under assault by less marginalized people. In these ways, visionary fiction is constantly applying lessons from our past to our futures. It's neither utopian nor dystopian. I'm not interested in like living on a cloud and like playing a lute for eternity. I'm really interested in like continuously generating solutions and figuring out the next evolution. Right? So for any of you lute players out there, it's all good. There's no judgment. Everybody has different ideas. Um, later you're going to have to come let me know if there's any loot players. I don't know if I've ever actually met one. Um, so hard, realistic, and hopeful. That's what we're generating. Now we're here in Arizona, a land where the voting majority believes in aliens and where my safety is determined by the proximity of my passport. And the future is also unfurling here right in this room. So it's utopia, it's dystopia, perspective is everything. As long as the future comes from imagination, there will be divergent paths that are moving in and out of alignment and in and out of conflict. Our ideas of right and wrong shift with time. Right now, it's clear to me that something is wrong if it hurts this planet. But if we don't claim the future, that sense of loyalty to Earth, of our environmentalism, could become an outdated concept. Kenny Bailey from the Design Studio for Innovation shared this recently on a panel called Black to the Future, that justice and rights all these things that we take for granted even as we fight for them, they're not permanent. They could become old concepts. It's on us to determine whether they get held in the future. It affirmed to me that it's so important we get in the game, that we get dirty and experimental. How do we create and proliferate a compelling vision of a new economy that centers humans and the natural world over the accumulation of material? We embody, we learn, we release the idea of failure. It's all data. But first, we imagine. We are in an imagination battle right now. Claudia Rankin and Terry Marshall have both spoken of this. Trayvon Martin and Mike Brown and Renisha McBride and all of them are dead because in some white imagination they were dangerous. And that Im imagination is so respected that those who would kill based on an imagined racialized fear of black people are rarely held accountable. Imagination has people think that they can go from poverty to millionaire as part of a shared American dream. Imagination turns brown bombers into terrorists and white bombers into mentally ill victims. Imagination gives us borders and gives us superiority and gives us race. We have to imagine beyond those fears. We have to ideate together. The poverty that results from our current system allows this imagining to be fed by the results of a scarcity economics. We must imagine new worlds that transition us from seeing black people as murderers or brown people as terrorists or aliens to ones that can see black and brown people as cultural and economic innovators and peers. Yes. Um, 
So Black Lives Matter, which has issued a clarion call to us in this time, is brilliant on so many levels, one of which is that they created products to support their work almost immediately, making the look of the movement irresistible and undeniable. And I hope that all of you have your Black Lives Matter sweatshirts already or soon, because every race should be wearing them. They are now gathering stories from black people about what the world will look like when Black Lives Matter. This time travel exercise for the heart is ideation. What are the ideas that will liberate all of us? And the more of us who collaborate on that ideation, the more people who will be served by the worlds that result. And sci-fi is simply a way of practicing the future together. I suspect that that is what many of you in this room are up to, practicing a future economy together, building and practicing economic justice together, living into new stories. It is our right and responsibility to create a new world. You are all practicing that. And what we pay attention to grows. Have you heard that? I didn't make that up, but I don't quite know where it comes from. Anybody know where it comes from? It's many places, right? It's just like a universal thing. All right, I don't feel bad for not knowing. I'm gonna let it go. So what we pay attention to grows, and I'm thinking about how we grow what you all are imagining and creating into something that's large enough and solid enough for a tipping point of humans to cross over. Ursula Le Guin, uh, one of my favorite science fiction writers, repping for Seattle, um, she recently said, we live in capitalism, its power seems inescapable, but so did the divine right of kings. She went on to say, it's up to authors to spark the imagination of their readers and to help them envision alternatives to how to live. I agree with her. We must make an alternative economic future, as Tony K. Bambara taught us, irresistible. That was our goal with the Octavius Brood Anthology, to have a collection of compelling and irresistible stories. But I think you all are amongst the protagonists of what might be called these great turning stories, these change stories, these new economic stories. Do you think that's true? Are you like ready to be this, the heroes and sheroes of the future? All right. And they rose, I guess, in a new generation. Okay. So also I want to say that I think it's really healing behavior. I think to look at something so broken as our current economy and our current structure of society and to see it whole and to imagine something that could serve everyone is actually a healing activity. So I am a healer. That's how I work as a healer is I just look at the body that I'm working with um, and that I'm holding between my hands and I imagine wholeness. Um, and I let wholeness kind of flow through my system into that body. And I think that's what you're doing too. And I'm grateful that you're doing it. And I want to say thank you over and over again a million times. Um, I also want to say that I think this is in part because of you practicing what I've been calling emergent strategies. So now is where I go on the science nerd part of my story. Um, and that's I hopefully a good ride for y'all. I think science is so cool now. I didn't think that when I was a kid at all. Um, but now I think it's awesome. Do any of you know what emergence is? You're all like emergence practitioners. All right, so for those who don't know, emergence is the way complex patterns and systems arise out of relatively simple interactions. Birds flocking, schools of fish in motion, the way mushrooms grow underground. Mushrooms are my favorite thing. Um, I recently got gifted a little mushroom as a pet <laughs> because I talked so lovingly about mushrooms and someone said, you should have this lion's mane mushroom to carry with you. Um, my mentor, Grace Lee Boggs, who is about to turn 100 years old in Detroit, uh, she is so brilliant. And she first raised this concept with us in Detroit after reading Margaret Wheatley's work about biomimicry and mycelium magic. Grace started asking us what our movements would look like if we focused on critical connections instead of critical mass. We need each other. And I love the idea, it's a good idea. I love the idea of shifting from mile wide, inch deep movements to inch wide, deep, mile deep movements that schism the existing paradigm. Strategy, is just a military term that means a plan of action towards a goal. We currently use it to mean something's good or bad, but it's actually not that discerning. Really horrible plans can be pitched as strategic. We have to be more precise, so emergent strategies are ways for humans to practice complexity and grow the future through relatively simple interactions. 
This is what made sense to me when I was trying to explain the kind of leadership in Octavia Butler's books. It wasn't just that it was black and female and young leaders, or perhaps it was because of all of those things, but who leads matters. But what I noticed is that her leaders were adaptive. They rode change like dolphins or surfers ride the ocean. They were adaptive but also intentional, like birds migrating south who know how to get where they're going even when a storm knocks them off 100 miles. I just came from supporting a meeting that Naomi Klein called in Canada to set an intention to build a clean energy economy in that nation. And I was so moved by their work to build a shared intention. That's radical imagination. Oh, what does it say? Oh, good. I'm doing great. Um, <laughs> just so y'all know, don't be worried. I'm going great. Um, <laughs> So Octavia's protagonists were also interdependent and often polyamorous because the personal is political, because pleasure evokes change perhaps more than shame. And I think this is something that our movements are going to learn in an interesting way. So rather than being like, you're such a horrible racist, it's more like, how can we turn this into, oh, I can't take it there. <laughs> okay, so you'll get it later if you don't have it now. But right now there is an effort called BOLD. Black Organizing for Leadership and Dignity, and it's cultivating a safe space for black vulnerability and mutual support of leaders. And it's countering the usual model of leader isolation. We all need a place where we can weep and be held and feel our feelings and figure out how those feelings can direct our next evolution. And what amazes me is that in this space of such constant 28 hours black trauma, we get together and we don't we, we celebrate, and we love on each other, and we laugh, and we find the pleasure of community and interdependence with each other. It feels good to be together. And I think y'all are experiencing this too. When you find your tribe, your flock, your people, you're like, yes, how do I grow this, right? Octavia's leaders were also decentralized, and they were generative. And resilience came from their decentralization that no one person held the power, which I think is a major lesson from the civil rights movement. Ferguson recently showed us the power of individuals willing to act without a single leader, and their leaderful example is now inspiring others to stand up in real time, offline and online, to change legislation and perception. Ferguson and other movements were also fractal, practicing at a small scale what we most want to see at the universal level. No more growth before experience. There's a group in New Orleans called the Wild Seeds that's doing this fractal work. It's a women of color, body, practicing pop-up galleries and stores where they put forward black beauty, black fantastic, black creativity as their counter to racism. And I think it's a beautiful counter, like what are we creating and generating? And how do, how do we then sustain ourselves on our radical creativity rather than our radical victimhood? Then rather than narrowing into one path forward, Octavia's leaders are creating more and more possibilities. That's what I see here. Not one perfect path or one single organization or, or business, but an abundance of futures of ways to manage resources together and be brilliant together. So I have become obsessed with how we can be movements like flocks of birds, underground power like that massive mushroom under Oregon, how we can be the seashell representation of a galactic vision for economic justice. I invite you to join me in writing ourselves into the future, naming the principles of total transformation, building an economy in which black lives matter because every single life and all that supports life matter. Let us practice in every possible way the world we want to see. I love y'all.